This is an Amiga power supply. Many of these have been happily working on and off for the last 35 years. And like all vintage power supplies, the question of whether you should trust your precious Commodore heirloom to one of these devices is something of a hot potato topic. There are those in the if it ain't broke camp, and I'm sure they're very happy with their period correct electricity. And there are those in the if you use this, it will kill your computer, you and probably puppies and kittens camp. And sometimes they'll both be right, but not about the puppies and kittens. I prefer to use modern power supplies with my Commodore machines, especially C64s. This one here is my C64 power supply built for me by the lovely Adam Commodore lad. When I'm repairing computers, I need to know that the power supply hasn't just fallen over and taken all the ICs with it. This is my Amiga power supply. It's been gutted and a meanwhile has been stuffed inside. I did this a few years ago now and out of shame, I won't be showing you the insides of this one. Instead, I'll be going through the process of converting one like this into a more reliable and safe power supply. I'm not an expert with these things, so please bear that in mind as you watch this video. Everything you see here will be based on my findings watching other YouTube channels and having been an electrician many, many years ago. When selecting an Amiga power supply for conversion, the first problem you will run across is finding one with a suitable case. There are many different versions with different size outer cases and, to complicate things, different insides. These 312503 models are very tricky. There are two different sorts of these. The lighter one here has already been converted to a meanwhile, but this had a circuit board screwed into the bottom of the case. I created a principal part to hold an RT50B meanwhile in place and it works very well. This other 312503 is identical on the outside, but inside it has the PCB mounted vertically and a very heavy transformer. Taking all of this out leaves no easy way to fix a mean well safely in place. Eventually I'll figure out a way of doing this as I have a bunch of these waiting for conversion. It's also not possible to fit a mean well inside one of the smaller power supplies. So those are out too. As long as you go for a bigger light one, there should be a way to upgrade it. The PSU I'm working on today is a model 391029. A good choice as they have plenty of room inside and don't require modification. The easy way to spot them is to check out the screws. The heads of the screws are close to the bottom surface of the case. Other types have very long screws set deep in the holes. Another telltale is the screws on these ones are in the four corners. Some of the other types have two screws offset. Inside the mainboard is not held in by any screws. It's actually held in place by the top half of the case and can just be lifted out. Taking a closer look, this resistor here gets very hot, causing scorching on the back of the board. I don't need this or anything on it, but I do need the cables, so off they come. Any copper inside the crimp section is no good to me, so I'm cutting as close as I can to preserve as much of the cable as possible. On the other side, the main switch looks okay. I'm not a big fan of this bare metal, but I will keep an eye on it to make sure it can't cause problems. It's not the end of the world to recrimp these if necessary. The mean well I'll be using for this upgrade is the RT50B. It's capable of four amps on the five volt rail and two amps on the 12 volt rail. That's more than enough for most applications, but if needed, an RT65B can be used, which will provide ample current. I buy my units from DigiKey, where they only cost around 15 pound, excluding tax and postage a good item to add to an order to bulk it up and get free delivery. The bottom part of the case is where the mean well will sit, but I need a caddy to prevent it from moving around. On Thingiverse, I found this uh, thing. I assumed it would be exactly what I needed and printed it out. It fits great inside here, but when I offered the mean well power supply up to it, I realized there's a big problem. On the base of the RT50B mean well, there are two fixing holes offset along the center line. This plastic caddy has mounting holes in the four corners. My first thought was maybe it was meant for the bigger Meanwell RT65B, but that has a similar layout and is just bigger. I did entertain the idea of just wedging the 65B in here, which is what I did with my original, but no, I want to do this properly. It turns out that this 3D print is meant for the Meanwell PT45B, which is a bit different from the one I'm using today in that it doesn't have a metal case and the termination for the wiring is a row of pins. 
During the charity event, I built a couple of Meanwell power supplies for the Amigas I auctioned, and at the time I discovered that all of the Thingiverse 3D prints for this purpose didn't suit the exact power supplies I had. So I ended up designing my own. These work great, and I wish I'd had more time in order to record that process, but these parts here are what was left over. This one looks to have all the holes in the right places, and it fits perfectly. The mounting holes for fixing the Meanwell also line up just right, so I'm going to use this rather than printing a whole new one. Screws suitable for a floppy disk drive are the exact right type for this, and as long as they're not too long, they'll do a good job of holding things in place. You might notice I've also cut out a couple of sections at either end of the caddy. This is for the mains wires. I don't like running them over the top of the metal case. That feels like asking for trouble with single insulated mains voltage wires. Testing the fit, it looks like the incoming mains wires are pressing too hard into the metal case, so I snip a little off the outer sleeve to give them more room. The switch connectors sit above the meanwhile casing, but only with the switch the wrong way up. I'll work this out later in the build. The wires, however, are much too short to reach where they need to go, so I'll be extending them with some suitable wire salvaged from a similar cable. There are all kinds of ways to join two pieces of wire together. I'm sure that soldering these and covering them in heat shrink tubing would be absolutely fine, but solder isn't the strongest connection, and with free floating cables that will be subject to movement from vibration, I worry that the solder could end up cracking. For similar reasons, I won't be using screw terminals that I can't fix down. This isn't something to worry about with 5 or even 12 volts. The worst that could happen if disaster struck is you would fry some expensive components. But with cables carrying 240 volts, I want to make sure that the connection is mechanically strong and able to stay that way. And the best way that I know how to do that is with crimps. But these crimps go one stage further with extra strong heat shrink, the join will be almost as strong as an uncut cable. By the way, if you won the Amiga 600, hello James, or the Crystal Amiga 500, hello Darren, this is exactly the process I went through with your power supplies. These are not like heat shrink tubing, which only need around 120 degrees C to shrink. This type requires around 200 C, and you can see the plastic bonding with the cable beneath. That's all three extended. The wires will run safely under the plastic caddy and up to the connectors at the other end. Before I go any further, I need to inspect the plug top. I do this for every one I come across and often find something I don't like inside. This one has too much cable crammed into the plug, which has led to the live cable being crushed. It will probably be okay, but I don't like it, so I'll snip all of this old cable off and start again. There, that's how it should look. Now the other end can be connected to the mains terminals and I'm ready to test this. I'll switch it on before turning it on at the wall. The back of that switch has live mains voltage, so I don't want to touch it while it's floating around. The LED is a good sign, and with my multimeter, I measure plus five, plus 12, and minus 12 volts. The yellow wire on this cable is the shield. I could leave this floating, but I'm going to connect it to the earth cable to give a little extra protection. 
The earth cable is not the same as the ground connection. Red is five volts, black is ground, brown is 12 volts, and white is minus 12 volts. I buzzed all of these out with a multimeter to make sure they're all in the right places. I even made a little sketch. If you're following along, check your own cable as Commodore were not consistent with their color coding. The last thing I want to do before closing this up is adjust the five volts. I will do this on camera without a load, but it's better to do this with a computer connected to get the best result. Just over five volts should get me pretty close. And now I can put it together. But wait, something is niggling at my brain. Let's open it up again and check. I've put the switch in the right way up and the connectors are pressing against the metal case. This is not ideal. So I'm just putting a few layers of insulation here to protect it against mishaps. The final test is to see if this will power an Amiga. This A600 belongs to my friend Fuzzy Lee. It's here as a recent patient having had all of its leaky caps replaced. The power supply also belongs to Lee. Nice, all working as expected. The final thing I want to do is dial in the 5 volt rail. Now it has a load. 5.03. 5.03 volts was a decent guess, but I might as well get it right on the money. There, perfect. perfect. That's what I said. That's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.